let me introduce you to our special guest tonight, Dr. Kier Ross. Dr. Kier Ross is a is a is a I'll call you a new surgeon in the area. Although you've done your you've done your residency at NYU, you've uh, just just came on staff at with New York Orthopedics. He is uh, he is in New York City a ton, but he also sees patients in Westchester. Where else do you see patients, Dr. Ross? So I'm in uh, in the city. I'm in Westchester, and then I go out to uh, Westbury, Long Island, uh, once a week as well. All right, nice, excellent, excellent. Dr. Ross, like I said, did his residency at uh, NYU, did his fellowship at uh, Lenoxville Northwell Health, and is met with us. Um, but more importantly, he did his undergrad at Cornell, where he played college ice hockey. Was, That's right. He, and he was an all American there and he was the captain his senior year and he scored a ton of goals and uh and played <laughs> and had had no minuses ever, right? That's exactly right. Yeah, you got yeah. you nailed it. <laughs> all right. Uh but that brings me to the topic tonight. The topic that we're talking about tonight is uh is clavicle fractures, something we see a, pretty frequently in ice hockey players. You know, if if a hockey player doesn't have an AC joint separation or a clavicle fracture, I, I question how, uh, how good of a hockey player he was. So. But uh, with, with that said, anything else you'd like to say about yourself or, or reveal, sir? Yeah, no, I mean, that's about it. I appreciate the introduction. I have sustained a, uh, a couple clavicle fractures and AC joint injuries myself, so I th I'm glad I, uh, I met your benchmark. <laughs> well, he, so he was good, uh, Tim. So he was good. <laughs> He was good exactly. enough to get injured. Yeah. That's exactly. He was good. Totally. Uh, yeah. Oh, but no, I think I think that uh that just about covers it. I mean, just to talk, I guess I could talk about my practice and the kind of stuff I, I treat. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh I did a sports medicine fellowship. So of course, you know, uh shoulder and knee arthroscopy and hip arthroscopy are kind of my main main uh you know, the main parts of my practice. Um, but I do uh arthroplasty and a, a fair bit of trauma as well. And I uh, take call at a few different hospitals in the area. So I do a lot of fracture work, uh, including clavicles and um, and other higher energy injuries as well. So it's definitely, I'm definitely up my alley talking about clavicles and everything as well. So Outstanding. Outstanding. When we talk about clavicle fractures, who gets clavicle fractures? Is it older people? Is it younger people? Is it children? Who, who's getting clavicle fractures? Right. So the the most common is is young men around the age of twenty or sometimes less. Pediatric clavicle fractures definitely are not uncommon, but uh, we worry about them less because, like with any other fracture, they in the pediatric population they tend to heal really reliably and they remodel well too. So they're almost never operative in in pediatric patients, uh, but most commonly in male athletes that play contact sports, lacrosse, hockey. And, uh, you know, obviously we see them in, in older patients as well, but certainly less often. Uh, don't, don't forget about some of the most important athletes on the earth, horse racing jockeys. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah also they a get, common one. They yeah. get, they get uh, clavicle fractures quite often. Um, so, but um, as do, as do mountain bikers, I was told by a colleague of mine, people that are in Colorado riding mountain bikes, they fall off those mountain bikes. They're falling on their tip of your shoulder, tip of their shoulders usually, or or trying to break their fall. That's what our motocross guys too. One of my partners, Joe, is a motocross uh -huh. guy. All, all his friends have fractures. Clavicle fractures. So they, wow. they must be. Go. So they must be good. So they must be good. <laughs> Doctor Ross, that brings us to the mechanism of injury. Uh, what is the mechanism of injury in your experience for clavicle fractures? Yeah, so as you kind of alluded to, it's usually a, a load, a lateral blow to the shoulder. So the the clavicle itself or the AC joint are both get loaded when you have a direct blow. A lot of times with uh, the shoulder slightly, you know, dipped down, the clavicle is kind of loaded axially along its length, and then the force dissipates through the bone itself. So again, you know, falling off of a bike or a horse, going into the boards when you're hit in hockey, box lacrosse, things like that are, are really... Uh, common risk factors you know football can be a common one too shoulder to shoulder contact anything where your arms tucked in and that lateral side of the shoulder kind of takes the blunt or the brunt of the force i wonder if there's been less than quarterbacks since they uh penalize you for driving the quarterback into the ground now yeah i would think so i, I would, would think, think so, so too but 
I have yet to see that data. When when someone does get a clavicle fracture, is the fracture like right in the middle and it breaks in half? Is it at one end, the proximal end? Is it at the distal end? What is it usually? Do you know? Do we even know that data? Yeah, yeah. So there there is data showing that the vast majority of them are mid shaft, so kind of in the the middle third of the of the bone itself. And medial, I actually did see medial ones are pretty uncommon. I did see one somewhat recently, but that was in a polytrauma patient that was in a car accident. So it's usually more that kind of situation. And then distal clavicle fractures near the lateral edge of the clavicle are are not uncommon, but they're definitely a kind of their own entity. You know, whether or not they involve the CC ligaments becomes a whole nother variable that gets thrown into the mix and fixing them becomes slightly more complicated too based on whether or not you need to do a CC ligament reconstruction or if you can get enough purchase uh, laterally uh, through the plate. So luckily those are more, uh, since they're more slightly more challenging, uh, they're a little bit less common, but a mid shaft is definitely the, the one we see the most. And there's data again, to, sh to show that. When the mid when it's, when it's the mid shaft one, is the subclavian artery, artery that, that lies beneath the clavicle usually involved? Is it, is it a, is it punctured? Is it, uh, what happens with that? Or it just, it's okay because the bone protects it. I don't know. Rarely. So there's, there's also the subclavius muscle in between that provides a little bit of protection. Okay. It, it has been reported and it is, it's actually in one of the few absolute uh, indications to fix uh, a clavicle fracture. If there's a significant vascular injury that requires repair, but it, it's rare. I've, I've, it's reported. I've actually never seen it myself clinically but it is something to keep in mind when we fix them too the the artery sits slightly posterior to the clavicle so um, some surgeons will in intentionally aim their screws instead of straight down through the plate they'll aim them slightly anteriorly just to make sure you stay away from it i've never had that problem myself but i do i have seen it happen before i'm in a hospital i worked at yeah excellent thank you so a patient comes into your into your office or into your um you're covering a football game which you do cover. Uh, by the way, did Hendrick Hudson win this uh, this weekend or no? They're out, but Valhalla's still going. Valhalla's uh, okay. in their final on Saturday. <laughs> oh, they're in the section finals. Rob, this yeah, is uh, Westchester yeah. Westchester football. We cover a bunch of football teams up there. So yes. when you get when someone come when you go on the field and you feel and you palpate underneath the shoulder pads to see if there's a deformity there and you, and they're complaining of pain right over there. Mm -hmm. Do you get an X-ray right away? Do you get an MRI? then do you go non-op, op? What's your, what's your um, thought process with that athlete? Let's say it's a football player or a hockey player. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, step one is what you said, just kind of palpate and see if you can feel, you know, any kind of, a lot of times you can feel a fractured gap if you just walk your fingers along the bone, just go from the SC joint across to the AC joint. And usually you, if there is a fracture, at least a displaced one, you, you'll find it. And then if you're worried or you're pretty suspicious, uh, honestly, regardless, I would try to take a look under the shoulder pads and look at the skin itself, because that's going to tell you a lot about how urgent it is. And, you know, if it's a displaced fracture, you'll see, you know, you'll see that soft tissue swelling. And if that usually it's the the medial fragment that is elevated up by the sternocleidomastoid attachment. So you'll you'll see some prominence there. Even if the skin's not threatened, there'll be a bit of swelling in the area. It'll be more prominent. But the most important part about actually taking the jersey or taking the pads or both off uh, is to make sure the skin's not tenting or threatened. Because if that's the case, you know, it's reasonable to send them to the ER if you're, if you're really worried about it. Otherwise, you know, I think it's very reasonable to put the player in a sling and kind of non-urgently get, get x-rays and, and, you know, see them in the clinic that week. And then at that point, you can have a discussion about pros and cons of surgery. Right. That leads us to the non-op care. So uh, the non-op care is a sling. It's a sling for how many weeks? Four weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks? And Yeah, about, and... Uh, about the first two, they're pretty reliant on the sling and just coming out of it essentially to shower and do elbow, hand and wrist range of motion to, to prevent stiffness. And then, you know, pass, starting passive range of motion, depending on their level of comfort within the first, you know, three weeks or so, and then kind of progressing from there. Do the not do the ones that you treat non op go to go on to non union or not heal? What is the do you know the literature if they heal or not or if they if they don't and and like like not every fracture is totally aligned as you showed me right. in some X rays in the clinic recently. I mean you showed me one where it was like they were at they were at like a forty five degree angle. 
<laughs> and you're like, oh no, we'll treat this non off. I'm like, what are you crazy? <laughs> So, so yeah, so this, it's kind of a, a topic that's evolved over the last couple of decades. So, and, and that's kind of the main discussion to have with the patient and the, and the kind of my main thought process is it's less about, I would say less about return to sport and less about functional outcome and more about what's their risk of non-union, right? So plating it is certainly has been shown to decrease your risk of non-union but then to answer your question, it's uh, so how do you know which ones are going to not heal and go on to non-union? Right. How long does that take? So the there's a lot of studies that have shown repeatedly the, what the risk factors are. So one is, and probably the one that's been re-demonstrated the most, is the amount of displacement. So they talk about, in most studies, 100% displacement, meaning the bone ends are not opposed at all. So there's no cortical contact anymore. So that's probably the biggest risk factor for non-union. Comminution has been shown to be a risk factor. Usually when there's a comminuted mid-shaft clavicle, it's one piece, one or two pieces of comminution right in between the two main fragments. And so if you have two fragments elevated up, usually the comminution kind of almost looks like it's bridging it. And that's called a Z deformity for obvious reasons. It makes a Z kind of shape. And that has been shown to be a risk factor. Two centimeters of shortening is a risk factor too. Mm -hmm. So meaning if the bony ends have bayoneted a little bit by about two centimeters, that's a risk factor as well. Female, older patients, smokers, some of those risk factors that have been shown for other fractures as well have been, again, you know, shown to be a risk for, for non-union and clavicles too. So there's pretty good data for that. And I usually kind of in a, in a simple way, lay that all out for the patient. And essentially, you know, you, it, there's no score that I'm aware of that you can use to calculate what the risk of non-union is that exists for tibial shaft fractures, fa uh, yes. fractures, but not yet for clavicles. But it, it almost just gives you more of a kind of intuitive sense of, of what their chances are. So if you see a big Z deformity, shortened, displaced, right. comminuted, I would, you know, the discussion is pushing a little more towards surgery. There's a little bony apposition. It's not comminuted. They don't smoke. You know, it's more reasonable to to think about just just non-operative treatment. And that was again, like I said, the mainstay for decades until there was more data coming out to show that the non-union rate is probably, you know, instead of being three to five percent, and we now know it's more like fifteen or twenty. Okay. With non-operative treatment. When I was preparing for this podcast, I saw something that. Sometimes non-union can affect scapula humor rhythm and cause yes. dyskinesis. That was that was kind of striking to me. I mean, when I when we as physical therapists think of scapula dyskinesis, we're thinking about you know the muscles and how there's not co-contraction and between the the forces to produce the proper scapula humor rhythm to get the glenoid aligned in the proper position so that the so that the humeral head can pivot off it and function. Mm. Um, what happens in the in the, in the clavicle fracture that they're talking about in some of these articles I read prior to this podcast? Yeah, no, it's it's a great question because that's a newer that's kind of a newer uh, topic in in the world of of you know clavicle fractures. So the thought is that if you especially if you have shortening of the of the clavicle, so again two centimeter displacement or so. Essentially, what happens is the acromion is medialized because it comes with the clavicle. Okay. So that alters the position of the scapula on the chest wall. And then basically what they, it's mostly theoretical, but the idea is that throws off your scapular thoracic rhythm. So I guess the normal rhythm, as I'm sure you guys know, is is two to one, right? So right. for for every you know, X degree of humeral motion, that's the ratio to scapular motion, but that gets altered when the position of the scapula has changed on the thoracic wall. So I'm not sure that that's been quantified exactly, you know, how the ratio is altered, but certainly what's been shown is that strength and fatigability are affected by it. So shoulder strength because of that shortening definitely decreases and the fatigability has been shown in multiple studies, I think, to be negatively affected too. Uh, excellent. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. For, 
educated me on that because I because I was I was uh, surprised to see that in the literature. So yeah. um, I don't know if you guys, have you guys so noticed was, that when you're yeah. rehabbing clavicle, the patients post op yeah, they have gonna, weakness was, for. I think part of it, and see what you think, Tim. The no, SC, yeah. the AC, the SC and the AC joint itself maybe changes the biomechanics or the mechanics within the joint, right? So you're not getting all the orthokinematics that goes with it. Because we know when we get full, full shoulder flexion, we need posterior rotation of the clavicle as part of the kinematics of it. So I just wonder if all that trauma throws off the, the joints on either end of that. So. I would agree with you, Rob. That's a great point. Definitely the conoid and the trapezoid become taut. They turn the, the uh, clavicle posteriorly so that you can get full flexion range of motion actively. That, um, I, I think that's probably it, but I did not see that in the articles I read prior to this podcast. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do wonder how often there's concomitant SC or AC injury with these, and I think it's probably higher than we think. Uh, certainly, even like low grade AC sprains are starting to be shown to be more of uh, symptomatic for a longer period of time than uh, used to be appreciated. So. Mm -hmm. I think probably patients that go on to union and still have that shoulder pain, they probably have some injury to their SC or AC joint or both. And that's why they continue to have symptoms if it, presuming it heals the fracture. Gotcha. I know that you're a team physician for uh, a jujitsu or, or for, what is the martial arts that you uh, work with? Yeah. So I, I cover a couple jujitsu academies that are yeah. Uh, a couple of them are MMA gyms that have, you know, kickboxing, MMA guys, and some uh, and pure some guys that train only jujitsu and, and wrestling too. So I take care of the guys from a couple of those academies uh, around town too. Nice. Um, I haven't seen a clavicle fracture in them in any of those guys yet, but certainly a lot of finger injuries, knee ligament injuries, shoulder instability. Um, so there's definitely a high rate of injury, but. Luckily for them, clavicle is one of the few things they they don't get as often. I think because they're not, it's not like football or hockey where they have momentum. They're relatively right. stationary. You know what I mean? So right. unless they took a direct blow right to the clavicle, they could get know. dropped on their the tip of their chromium and. That's and true. That that's way. true for from takedowns, wrestlers, and jujitsu guys definitely. Would, Never know. That's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, but. If you have a professional athlete, whether it be an MMA fighter and they have that rare injury or a pro hockey player or, or a, uh, a jockey, by, by choosing to operate, do they get back quicker? Do you decrease their chance of re-injury? What is your thought process on that? If I need to get Connor McDavid back as quickly yeah. as possible for the playoffs, am I plating that or am I going non-op? What would you do? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I think... A lot of it has to do, I think the short answer is I'd probably be more aggressive about plating it. One is, again, the main reason is still going to be to decrease their odds of non-union, right? Especially if it's just a displaced or shortened or ball with fracture, yeah. right? Because you don't want to put them through, you know, X amount of time off waiting for it to heal. All of a sudden you're two, three months out, it's not healed. And then you've burned all this time. Right. Uh, and there is some data that they still heal a lot. If you wait and then fix them later, the union rate is still the same, but there's a higher risk of other complications like wound issues and, and, and need for hardware removal. So certainly I'd be a little bit more aggressive for that reason. Um, and then to answer your other question about return to sport, there's a little bit less data about that. There's data to show that elite athletes get back quicker in general than non-athletes. And there's some data, but not a ton that I'm aware of that shows that the return to sport rate is slightly higher um, if you fix them. But that data is all over the place. So I think right. probably the it it's almost like an ACL where like we tell people nine months, but it's plus or minus and everybody's a little different. Sure. But that number for clavicles is three months plus or minus elite athletes get back a little quicker even if you non off them. Um, so. So that, so that probably we should segue right into our article that we chose to discuss um, in general. Um, and that was comparing, uh, that was comparing non-operative treatment of clavicle fractures to operative procedures for clavicle fractures. Let me just bring up the article. 
I have a quick question while Tim is doing that. Yeah, so that, yeah, sure. You're talking about like subclavius. I know it's such a small muscle. Is it a repair? Yeah. Is it something that gets torn? Is it something that we even think about? I know it's a good stabilizer. And yeah. It's so tiny, but I don't know what it looks like from your perspective. Yeah. No, we don't. I, I, I don't. I can't say you rarely get a great look at it. Sometimes you see it under because we at least the way I fix them. Some people fix them anteriorly. And I've mostly done superior plating and you're looking straight down at the bone. So the typically, even if it's displaced, you don't get a great look because the bone ends are overlapped, if anything, and then you bring them out to length. So you don't get really right, a good right. look through the gap. I've never I've never seen anybody repair one. Um, it's more of just like theoretically, there's some soft tissue envelope there that protects the artery. Right. Um, but yeah, and I'm, I agree, I agree with you. Mine, it's I think it's a pretty, uh, I guess not, it's not a very robust muscle. It's pretty thin and, and wimpy. So right. I, I don't think it does a ton, but it's right, right. at least something in between the bone and the artery. Well, it's funny because when you read about it, it says like a big, you know, it's a big component of it. But again, I would think it's really not much going on, but just all this interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So the, our article that we're reviewing is uh, out of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, and it's uh, it's entitled uh, Plate Fixation Versus Non-Operative Treatment for Displaced Mid-Shaft Clavicle fra Fractures. It's a meta-analysis of six randomized trials uh, done by the lead author, um, the lead author, Sarah Woltz. Um, they're out of um, Leiden University in the Netherlands. And they hope to compare uh, place fixation and non-operative care uh, to see which one had had more non-unions, which one had more secondary operation operations, and which one had a better functional outcome. Um, in this study, there was a total of 614 patients, and they were followed up at least at least a year. Yeah, so this, I mean, this paper, I think, is probably one of the uh... Kind of more higher quality studies out there on this topic, and then it also answers kind of the biggest questions, right? So I think that's why it's a good uh, a good article. Um, it, I mean, the biggest question, like I mentioned, and again, in my, at least in my mind, is always union versus non-union, um, and this is probably the highest level data that supports a lower rate of non-union. Certainly, there's a lot of smaller studies, some systematic reviews that have shown that too, but pretty reliable findings in this paper uh regarding that so i think it's a good you know reference to have in you know the back pocket of surgeons when they're deciding which route to go and, and how to educate patients for sure it was super the non-union rate for not for uh non-operative treatment uh i'm sorry for operative treatment was two percent and the non-union rate for operative treatment was 16 percent yeah that's that's pretty that's a pretty uh significant difference there yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I think if you told, you know, if you told somebody that they, you know, improve their odds by that much, I think a lot of people would be more interested in, in pushing towards the surgery, especially when the, you know, the complications are not insignificant, but the rates of the rate of complication is pretty low. So, you know, the, articles the, like this, I think have made me think a little bit more aggressively about, about op versus non-op. Right. And, and in fact, the, the rate of secondary surgery, excluding hardware removal, was actually greater in the non-operative patient population than the operative patient, uh, 16 versus uh, 7%. So that right. I found that striking, too, that, hey, you know what? You're not, even if you don't choose not to have surgery, you're not avoiding surgery, maybe. Yeah, so, yeah. So. That's a great point. Yeah, I was, I was actually surprised that the numbers were that high, too. I mean... At a certain point, it, the the trouble with that, I guess, actually, is before I uh, move on, was, uh, I was I should say the the interesting point about that is, you know, the the reason why you do it, right? So, and how you judge non-union. So, that's a pro really common problem in in any fracture study looking at non-union is how do you define non-union? So, some studies use CT, which is obviously higher sensitivity. Some just use X-ray. Some use clinical findings and x-ray, right? You could have a, a fracture that's completely non-tender, but the x-ray is somewhere in between. Not all studies have an exact objective definition of what a radiographic union means on x-ray. So how many of the cortices have bridging bone, things like that. So it makes it a little bit less clear what exactly, um, you know, 
have, what exactly to do with that information because non-union is unfortunately not a really well-defined variable. But regardless, certainly those patients that went on to have surgery after non-operative care, of course, were still symptomatic at the very least. So yeah, I was surprised at how many patients still went on to have surgery. Yeah, so was I. But uh, but a, a really reliable val- variable is the outcome scores they use, the constant score and the DAS score. And uh, another interesting caveat here is that although the mean differences were only 4.4 and the plate fixation showed a, be- showed a significant difference in these two scores, mm. it, it reached significance, but was it just a statistical significance or was it or was it not a clinical significance? And they brought that up in the discussion because yeah. there was less than less than 10 to 15 points generally is regarded as the minimal difference to uh, to be relevant for these scores. And they didn't achieve that uh, significance. So it was it was very interesting to, to see that, too. Um, so you don't necessarily get better, better uh, clinical outcomes with the plate than the fixation. Exactly, exactly. So and, and that's that's kind of exactly why I was saying my main focus when I think about it, is the union rate and not the outcome, because we don't really know. There's some other smaller studies that have suggested maybe the outcome scores are different, but there's a lot of variability in when they took those outcome scores, how far out their total follow-up was, and, you know, the higher quality studies seem to show, like this one, that uh, that there isn't a functional difference. It's, it's just about healing. Mm-hmm. Last point I wanted to bring up uh, about this paper was in the discussion, they alluded to pin fixation and minimal plate fixations. I'm not mm-hmm. aware of what, what they're talking about there. Can you explain to the audience what that is and do you use that? Is it not uh, is it not used as frequently? And then we'll move on. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I would say the main kind of fixation strategies are, I mean, certainly pe- some people make a very small incision and try to slide the plate along the bone. Some people are more prone to opening the incision a little bit larger so that you don't have to retract the skin as aggressively. Um, and then the, I guess the three main fixation strategies that I'm familiar with are superior plating um, okay. versus anterior plating. So with superior plating, you don't have to peel off essentially any deltoid muscle really, maybe a little bit laterally. Uh, there's a slightly higher risk of damaging the artery when you drill or put screws in. And what then about the with nerves anterior, up there? What about what about the neural vascular? What about the nerves up there? The super the super clavicle nerve, um, the sensory yeah. nerves up there, any of the neurovascular bundles bundles up there. Are you worried yeah. about that when doing those surgeries up there? Yeah, that's a great point. So there's some controversy about that. And I've, you know, in my training, I've kind of heard I, I don't think there's much data to support it. So it's mostly surgeon preference and some, you know, intuition, but some surgeons prefer to, there's two, there's usually two branches of the supraclavicular nerve that are cutaneous nerves here. And you encounter them essentially right when you get through the skin and subcutaneous tissue. Okay. And some people like to preserve them and, and leave them intact, take time to dissect them out, keep the plate under them and work around them. Some people feel like it doesn't matter. And basically you end up just retracting the nerves a bunch and and pulling on them, whether or not you think you are mean to, and that causes some kind of neuropraxia anyway. So some people ignore it and then just tell the patient you might have some numbness over the area. But the people that preserve them, the theory is that if you don't and you do cut through them, then there's a higher risk of getting a neuroma postoperatively and they can get symptomatic stump neuromas basically. I'm not really familiar with any data to show that. I think there's some small studies that have shown that, but at this point, it's just an opinion. Okay. Yeah. Uh, also, up there, up there, there's very little skin coverage for the clavicle. Um, yeah. just, I th- I kind of equated to the Achilles tendon, where there's very yeah. little skin coverage for the Achilles tendon. So that's what I was thinking about in my mind when I was reviewing for this. And so, the infection rates are they high? Are they similar to the Achilles? Do you have any idea what the per- are you getting an infection one out of every ten, two out of every ten? Yeah. What, what are you thinking? Yeah, so the uh, I'll make two points about that. So there, the infection rate, I think, compared to Achilles, for whatever reason, is is slightly lower. I think the infection rate, if I'm not mistaken, is typically below 5%. The real problem with this is just 
symptomatic hardware. So just painful hardware because the skin is so thin. So unfortunately, we'll often have to go back in just to remove the plate. And like you said, it's just, it's, there's not much tissue, especially with the superior plate, there's not much tissue there. And so patients will feel it. Very thin patients can even like see it a little bit. And sometimes that can irritate the skin and, you know, requires another surgery to take it out. So I think at least in my mind, I worry less about things like wound dehiscence and, and infection than something with an Achilles, but, but symptomatic hardware for sure, you know, is something to counsel patients about before the surgery. So most people will tell them about the numbness and the fact that the plate might have to come out later. So it's a lot like um, an olecranon fracture, for example, there's hardly any tissue there and those often have to right. come out. Or if you plate the front of a patella for a comminuted patella fracture, same thing. Okay. Rob, before we move on to the most important part of this uh, surgical procedure, the rehabilitation, do you have any other questions, Rob? I know. I was just trying to think of the different types of, so we have plates, anything KY, K, uh, KY, K wires, or are they doing anything where everything's just plated these days? Oh, right. Oh. Yeah. I think I kind of skipped past that. That's right. So the contour plate you taught me about the contour plate. Yeah. Yeah. So I, as kind of a younger surgeon, I've actually only used the pre-contoured plates. So there's, okay. there's plates that are kind of that S shape that sit on top of the clavicle and they have on the lateral edge, they have uh, what are called locking locking holes in them. So the screws actually are threaded and the screw holes are threaded. So those screws can lock into the plate. So if you have a more distal fracture, it gets you better fixation in those bone, in that bone, you can get more screws over there. So the pre contoured plates are really helpful in a lot of cases. And what we're seeing more and more of now is there's a good amount of surgeons that do anterior plating. So those are also pre-contoured, but like I was getting at before, you peel off a little more deltoid, but you don't have to worry about the artery. And actually there's some newer stuff talking about doing both and doing uh, dual plating, uh, which may decrease the non-union rate, but we'll see. Um, I'm skeptical because you do so much soft tissue dissection. I think you probably disrupt the blood supply to the fracture site a lot. But I know that is becoming more popular. And then the last technique that you mentioned, potentially doing a wire. I've never fixed a clavicle just with K wires. There is a somewhat older technique that I think some uh, pediatric surgeons do because it's minimally invasive and the fixation is a little less rigid and pediatric patients heal more readily. So there's some there's something called a Knowles pin uh, where you can actually put an intramedullary pin down the clavicle itself. It's almost like doing an intramedullary nail for another long bone. And it just gives you relative stability and, and allows that kind of callus to formation and form a little bit better alignment. And you mentioned corcoclavicular ligament. What do you do with it? Do you actually, how do you secure it? Is that the right word? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So in a, in a mid shaft clavicle fracture, you know, mm -hmm. I, I don't think about it, but on, in those very distal clavicle fractures that are lateral and close to the AC joint, if the clavicle is uh, elevated and that basically demonstrates that the CC ligaments are disrupted, there's basically two things you can do. So going in, I, I would have a pre-contoured plate with, you know, one of those uh, locking hole clusters distal, like in the lateral edge so that you can get more screws in that small lateral fragment. Uh, if it's too lateral, sometimes you can't get enough fixation there, uh, in which case uh, sometimes you need to supplement it with um, basically a corcoclavicular reconstruction. So what you do is you can put, there's a ton of different techniques to, on, on how to do it. It's but honestly CC ligament injury with the distal clavicle is probably its own topic, but you can use allograft or autograft tendon and loop it underneath the coracoid and then either fix it to the bone or uh, for the clavicle itself. Some people use like a non-absorbable suture, a heavy non-absorbable suture and do something similar and loop it under the coracoid and then around the clavicle and then, and then you tie it down and bring it down that way. My preferred technique actually, which is a newer, somewhat newer, uh, system that, that some implant companies have is you can put a tight rope or a button through the plate. And then the, the plate actually has a hole that that's made for the button to sit in. So uh, with the x-ray, you can drill through the plate and down into the coracoid. And then basically this, this suture button device goes from underneath the coracoid and through the plate. And then you use the suture that goes through the two buttons to tight, to cinch it down. And that compresses the clavicle back down by being under the coracoid base. And that's how you get your reduction. Don't so give that, it all that I find the easiest. All right. Don't give it all away. Cause we got to cover 
DC uh, in the spring. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm messing up your next nah, episode. that's all right. You know, <laughs> I appreciate it. Tell us about your rehab uh, guidelines. I you, I know that uh, personally from working with you, they're in a uh, post-op, they're in a sling about a week or two, and you allow pendulums right away. Uh, what else? Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. First couple of weeks in a sling, elbow, shoulder, uh, I'm sorry, elbow, uh, hand and wrist, a range of motion right away and gentle pendulums. And then the first, you know, three weeks are essentially just passive range of motion under the supervision of, you know, a, a therapist. And, you know, I think most surgeons do no forward elevation above 90 or 120 degrees at least, or at most. And so just passive motion early on to, uh, just prevent stiffness of the shoulder. And then after about three weeks or so, you know, that's typically when we start active assisted motion. And then between three and six weeks, you kind of start progressing towards once you're at the six week point to start doing active range of motion and then without an assist. And then somewhere between kind of, or I, I would say between six and nine weeks, you can start to do some strengthening, usually around eight, nine weeks with some resistance, progress from there. And then by the time, you know, you're at 12 weeks, as I mentioned before, around 12 weeks or so is where I feel comfortable, you know, talking about return to sport, maybe a little more aggressive with an elite athlete, but for most athletes, that would kind of be the ballpark. How do you, how do you make the determination when to start that training and start that return to activity? Um, I've always been taught by some of my mentors by it's by callus formation. If you have mm. good callus formation, you can progress. If you don't have good callus formation, you kind of need to wait till it happens so that you're not pulling apart the fracture. Is that still right. the case? How do you look at that? How do you even judge callus formation? I mean, is yeah. it a cloud on the x-ray? I, I'm not sure. Yeah. No, so that's a really good question, actually, and it, it brings up a few points. So I think I think the short answer. I keep giving you long-winded answers, but the short the short answer is I think it's it's controversial. But I would say that it it also depends on how you fix it, right? So if you have a comminuted fracture and you just bridge across it, meaning you don't compress it at all, right? Uh, then you will see callus formation on the X-ray, and then you can use that as a guide to figure out how much healing there is. If you don't do that and let's say it's just a straight mid shaft that displaced a lot and you get the bony ends perfectly posed you can either put a compression screw across it and then put a plate or you can actually use the plate to compress it when you fix it and when you have rigid stability like that we call it absolute stability uh, with a compressed fracture the bone doesn't heal with callus formation so you won't see a callus and it becomes very hard to judge so then it becomes basically only clinical. So essentially once the wound heals, you're going to get, you know, they're not going to be tender from that, but you can at least palpate the fracture and see if they have pain over it and see if they have pain with motion. So it's a little bit more of a gray area, I would say. Some studies use CT to assess callus formation, and that's certainly objective, but clinically, I don't think it's usually justifiable to get to get a post-op CAT scan on everybody. Okay. When you're returning that hockey player back to the ice and, and full contact, but they've done return to activity in that eight to 12 week period. Now, mm -hmm. um, eight to 10 week period. Now it's 12 weeks. They're out, they're skating. Does it matter if it's their top hand or if it's their bottom hand? Because a different load is produced on the clavicle by having it be their top hand or the bottom hand. Interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting question, actually. Yeah. So you, correct me if I'm wrong. I would think that the bottom hand is probably higher risk. I mean, one, because of your position when you're near the boards, you're probably more likely to go into the wall with your shoulder yeah. to tuck down a little bit with your bottom on your bottom hand side. And then your loading, two, your, I, bo your, your bottom hand gets loaded much more than your top hand. It's, for sure. Anytime you shoot, definitely right. one time or slap true. shots yeah. for sure. Yeah. So probably doesn't make a difference is what you're telling me. That's what I'm reading. Uh, you tell me, I don't know. I'm not aware uh, of any difference. I'm not, I'm not aware of any objective data about that, but I would intuitively would think bottom hand. I don't know. Did you see something about that? No, I did not. I was, uh, I was, I was at the uh, NHL players association conference 
and uh, and the topic came up, but there was no consensus. So I wanted to hear what your thoughts were. That's all. Yeah, Just, yeah. Uh, My vote's bottom hand is worse. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. That's all I. That's how I had. I mean, if there's any take-home messages or anything you want to tell the audience before we open it up to questions, I'd love to hear. Uh, but uh, certainly, that was extremely informative for me. I learned a ton tonight. So, uh, is there any uh, take-home messages that you like to uh, like to tell the audience? Yeah, sure. No, I, I no, I appreciate it. That was a good. Uh, it's definitely a good discussion. Um, yeah, I think I think the big things are, you know, how do you decide operative versus non-operative? So those prognostic factors are, you know, the amount of displacement, uh, shortening and, and the comminution. And then there's some other variables like older age and smoking and female gender that are probably uh, risk factors, but less of a slam dunk than, than just the displacement. Um, and then, you know, the important thing to remember is, uh, you know, fixing them is not really going to change functional outcome, most likely. But the idea is to prevent, to lower the risk of it not healing. Okay. Um, and then, you know, certainly these, there's plenty of patients that go on with non-operative treatment to non-unions that are asymptomatic that are fine, or they go on to having a malunion that doesn't, meaning it's very deformed still and don't have pain. But I think it'll be, the other take home is it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, over the next however many years, what we find out about. Uh, the significance of the effect on scapular thoracic motion. And yeah. if that's something that we've been missing, you know, for all these years, is that really, is that another reason to fix these is because, you know, that gets disrupted and patients that are, you know, need their uh, upper extremity strength and endurance, um, you know, maybe that would be a reason, another re reason to think about fixing them as if they rely on that. So. Right. My final question is, when I was working with some college hockey teams and some professionals, they use bone stimulators. Is there any evidence that a bone stimulator helps speed up healing in the clavicle or outcomes that showed, hey, you know what, a bone stimulator is the way to go with clavicle fractures in uh, athletes? Mm, yeah. I would, so, for yeah, maybe for a fracture you're treating non-operatively. I mm -hmm. think if you, if you, if it's minimally displaced, but um, you know, it's a high level athlete that you, you, you want to make sure you're not wasting any time. I think it's a low risk, uh, a low risk intervention to add on there. Um, I'm not aware of any specific data for clavicles, uh, itself, but I'm not either. Um, I'm right. Yeah. Yeah. It's something to think about though. We might have sure. to doc. We might have to do that study. Yeah. That's not a bad idea. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right, Rob, you have any questions or Donis, you want to open it up to uh, what's in the chat? I don't, I don't see anything in the chat, but let's see where you are. I, I got a question for you guys while we're uh, kind of opening yeah. up the floor. What, ahead, do you, what do you guys think are from a rehab standpoint, whether they're post-op or they're not tr being treated non-operatively, what, what do you think the difference maker is? Uh, is there any specific muscle group or exercises that really you think push patients over the edge to kind of have a better result, whether it's with their strength or their time to return as anything, even just anecdotally that you guys have noticed. Coming from my uh, athlete training background, I like to give some extra protection to these athletes when they return to play. So we'll use a girdle underneath their shoulder pads, or we'll use an AC joint uh, hard donut pad that they sell. And we'll use that. So in terms of the athlete training thing, I'll let the physical therapist, Rob, nice. uh, chime in on what he thinks about the rehabilitation piece of it. Yeah, I always, I mean, from the manual therapy side, I always think of, we have a, a pyramid way of thinking, like mobility, trump stability, make sure I think therapists miss that there's areas around it. And because you have a trauma to the clavicle, there's ribs and thoracic spine that have to get moving and everybody gets stuck. So it's mm -hmm. a matter of addressing that mobility deficits, get them in a good position activate the muscles and strengthen it. I think sometimes as a profession, we go right to, oh, let's get them stronger, but let's get the mobility, let's set up the base mm -hmm. and then move forward from that. That's that's kind of a, I think, you know, we all have similar exercises we do. I think sometimes it's what we do is, how do we sequence it might be a, big, a bigger change, you know? So that's- I see. So kind of keeping, not just the shoulder moving, but other, you know, adjacent joints 
moving yeah. and mobile and avoiding stiffness even before strengthening starts. Right, because you're somebody sense, who's yeah. stuck for you know you're in pain, so you're stuck forward yeah. in more of a kyphosis. T spine can't extend, or your ribs have that ability to torsion. You know, maybe they don't have that normal mechanics, or they're just holding because of pain. You know, get them sure. to move those areas, then kind of progress as an exercise with a good base. But yeah, yeah, yeah that's interesting. Thank you. All right. Somebody, uh, what's Looks that? Like we have a question, I think. Yeah. Maybe a couple. Agree. As uh, avoiding girdle elevation yeah. compensation patterns. Yep. So as they go through it, they're not, we have good biomechanics related to it. So I agree. Total, totally agree with that. I see. Interesting. So how do you guys go about doing that? You just kind of, as they're doing shoulder exercises, you just kind of depress their scapula or how, how do you, you do manage that? that. Well, I think of the mobility part, if they have to, you know, if it's stable, I mean, is the, we could test, does the SC joint have good arthrokinematics to it? Does the AC joint, does the, I you see. know, can they extend through the T-spine? So you kind of look at it from a mechanical and then from there, I think once you put, in my opinion, Tim, feel free, but if you put, sometimes you put the joints in its best resting position, the muscles will now function better because I'll end tension. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm stuck like this and my upper trap is really lengthened and my lat is really tight, if we if we get the muscle imbalance first, then the muscles that are lengthened have an easier ability to get stronger. They're not stuck in this length tension position where they're so stretched out, they just can't get good active and activation. So if we get them in the right position, a lot of times there are some thoughts of thinking that you know the mobility part is the key, and then from that you'll get stronger. Continue to do exercises because you put them; they can move correctly in a proper pattern. Somebody just texted okay. about mirror, mirror therapy. Is that what the person said in the text? I can't see it. Um, yeah, that is what it says. Yeah, yeah mirror but I'm feedback. Not, I'm not sure, sure there's evidence for mirror therapy for that. For, uh, there's mirror therapy definitely for for disuse and stuff like that, but I'm not so sure that there's evidence for mirror therapy for that. So I think, what they're, think what? I think they're talking about using uh, the sequence of using the mirror, not not as a. Uh, oh, like, okay. All right. Like, Yes. Like complex well, I mean, PRPS sort of thing, okay. or from hey, as you're doing. Yeah, it, totally agree. Activate. We yep. use a lot. We use a lot of mirror for biofeedback in our in our clinic for sure. Definitely. All right, Dr. Ross, thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you soon. All right. All right, yeah, guys. Yeah, really appreciate it. All right, this was fun. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye.